Okay, so our speaker today is Caroline Waller, and she is the Digital Records Description Archivist at the State Archives of North Carolina, specializing in government records. She holds an MLIS degree from UNC Chapel Hill and a Master's in Public History from NCSU. So let's welcome Caroline. Hi, everyone. Um, am I sharing my screen? No, you have to do it now. Oh. Thank you. I don't usually okay. use Zoom, so. And if everybody else would go ahead and go off camera and make sure you're muted, we'd appreciate it. There you go. Yep. Yeah. Let's see. It looks good. Yep, that is. All right. How does it look now? Looks great. Okay. All right. Um. So as y'all have already introduced me, I'm Caroline Waller. I'm the Digital Records Description Archivist. Um, here at the State Archives of North Carolina. Um, I've been with the State Archives for about three years. Um, and for about the bulk of my time at the State Archives, I've been working on the Treasures and Comptrollers reprocessing project. So I'm so excited to share all of that work with y'all today. Um, let's see here. So this presentation, it's going to um, discuss the behind the scenes of reprocessing a large complex legacy collection and then also get into some of the hidden histories or buried narratives that we uncovered in the process and the possible implications this might have for, for historians and genealogists. And hold on one sec. There we go. So a quick introduction on the Treasures and Comptrollers Papers or TNC as we call them. This is one of the State Archives' oldest collections and contains some of our earliest records. The main body of these records were transferred around 1920 or 1922 to the North Carolina Historical Commission, which was the precursor to the Archives and History Department. Um, as I said, this contains some of our earliest records. Some of the earliest records are from 1682 in our Ports and Shipping Records series. Um, and it roughly includes about 275 cubic feet of material. And if you look on the slide that shows the first 15 of the series, there's actually 44 series in this record group. And this is what this record group looks like when you go into DOC, which is our digital catalog. A little background on the processing of these materials. They were originally processed in the 1960s, and they were described in a 261-page finding aid. So essentially, this is a catch-all collection of early financial records. And it includes papers from the Office of the State Treasurer and the Office of the State Comptroller. So these were two separate govern or government agencies, two separate offices. Um, the Comptroller was essentially the precursor to the modern state auditor, which was established in 1862. And the first Comptroller's duties were some of the duties you would expect from the modern day state auditor. Um, the early duties were to direct the mode of stating, checking and controlling all public accounts and keep these accounts for the inspection by the General Assembly. And then the Office of the State Treasurer was just created to handle all of the public money. So as you can imagine, there's a lot of overlap in this and similarity in the type of records that both of these agencies created. So in the, eight, in the 1920s, when all of these papers came to the archives, the archivist at the time decided to intermingle these records because a lot of the records were very similar. Also, there was a lot of confusion with the transfer because they looked so similar. So that's how we get the Treasures and Comptrollers papers that we still have today. So in 2022, when we first started this project, this collection really hadn't been touched from a description or a physical preservation standpoint since the 1960s. As I said previously, there was a 261 page finding aid, but while this huge finding aid was really, you know, contained an abundance of information, it was also really unwieldy, difficult to navigate, and contained a lot of outdated language that we wanted to update. Also, this uh, finding aid, you could look at it physically in the search room, or you could go and try to find the PDF online. It's available somewhere in our digital collection, but it's kind of hard to find, and like even myself, I have a hard time finding this PDF online. Um, also, a lot of the information in the original finding aid was not put into our catalog that we use. There was a lot of difficulty, difficulty migrating this data over to our um, content management system that we call Axiom. 
So we had, we definitely had some issues with intellectual control over this collection. And then also from a physical standpoint, as you can see on the slide, most of the records were held in these out of date archival boxes. Um, and we figured out pretty quickly that these older out of date boxes were a preservation concern and that we needed to remove all the materials from these boxes and put them into modern archival boxes as soon as possible. And as I said, TNC, it's a heavily used, frequently cited collection, and we anticipated that we would only get more use and attention to this collection in the future. So for all of these reasons, we decided that we were going to embark on the Treasures and Comptrollers Rehousing Project. Um, and we also knew that this, this project was a top priority for us, not just because we knew that we physically needed to rehouse these materials, that the boxes were really old and we didn't have good intellectual control, but also we were really motivated to do this because the archives is currently joining in on a federal programming initiative to celebrate the 250th anniversary of the United States, which is July 4th, 2026. So currently at the archives, we're working on programming and research to engage with the significant anniversary and also increase our understandings of American experience across history, um, increase the diversity of the stories we tell with our collections, and then also just incre increase engagement with our historical record that we have here at the archive. TNC was immediately a very obvious target because we have a lot of materials pertaining to the American Revolution in this collection. Um, this collection, it's primarily financial records, which might seem rather dull, but we found this as a, we decided that this was an opportunity and embrace this reprocessing project as a way to increase visibility to individuals who may have been hidden in the 1960s legacy description. Because financial records are a place where you might encounter individuals that might not otherwise leave archival traces. So for example, enslaved persons or enslaved laborers or day laborers who would only leave their mark rather than their signature. These are likely people who aren't leaving behind correspondence or diaries in our private collections, but they did participate in the economy and they will show up in these financial records in different types of documents like pay vouchers, receipts and accounts. Um, also from an internal departmental standpoint, we have a goal of increasing conscious and reparative description and increasing visibility of underrepresented groups in our holdings. So we wanted to think about the groups and people who may have been excluded from the previous bicentennial programming and celebrations in which these exact same records were utilized, but in a very different way. So with all this in mind, going into the project, we expected to uncover some records that related to enslaved persons and other underrepresented groups but we were surprised that we encountered like such a breadth and depth of these records. And we decided that we were gonna like pull out all these stories and start highlighting them as hidden histories. And I'm gonna get a little bit more into the hidden histories that we found later in the presentation. But right now I'm just gonna quickly go over the logistics of this project. Um, also on the slide, this is um, the contents from the original finding aid. So it's a little bit confusing and most of these are the series, but if you look at it, there's also like random subjects in here that aren't series. So it's kind of confusing to, to navigate unless you know what you're looking at. So the first step of this project was a survey. As with most projects, we needed to get a better understanding of the scope of the project. So we did a survey where we, you know, physically looked at the 44 series in this record group. You can see a portion of this survey on the slide. And with the survey, we gathered various different data points that would help guide the project. Um, one of the main issues we found is that what was physically on the shelves was not accurately represented in our content management system. So it became very clear that we didn't have intellectual control over the collection. Um, also with the survey, we looked through, the, through all the series and we made note of any America 50 things that we might want to research or any kind of notes that might help us describe or you know do more research for each series later later on. So with the survey, we created our workflows. And normally the well, the second step of this project was rehousing all the documents immediately. 
And normally rehousing the documents, putting them in new folders, new boxes, this is part of the processing phase. But because those older manuscript boxes were such a conservation issue, we decided that we couldn't wait the one or two or three years it would take to get to each series to reprocess. We needed to do it as soon as possible. So we created a workflow and we utilized the help of over 34 staff members. We are working on it two hours a week, or sorry, two hours a day for about three months. And we rehoused all of these materials really fast. Um, and we made sure to make a workflow that was very specific of what they needed to do. So the staff members who aren't trained in archival processing, they wouldn't have to make any decisions. They literally just had to put the old records into new folders, into new boxes, and then document where everything was coming from. So as I said, we had at least two people working for two hours every day. We finished this in about three months. And at the end, we were able to move all of the folders into modern archival boxes, and we created container lists. And then, of course, an important part of the reboxing is creating a crosswalk because this was a heavily cited, um, a, a heavily cited collection. So as we were changing the container IDs and the folder titles and all the information, we wanted to make sure that folks could look at the old research and then have a crosswalk going back to figure out where the documents were. Um, on this slide, we have a timeline of how long everything took. As you can see, the survey, it took about four months because we had to physically go through a lot of the boxes. We didn't you know, spend all day working on that. And then we were able to do the rehousing in under three months because we had the help of all, all the other staff members. And then the processing took a better part of a year. Um, I did most of the series. And then my colleague, Alex Dowry, she did a couple of the series as well. And then here again is another example of those crosswalks that we were creating as we were doing the reprocessing. Um, as I said, this is a heavily cited collection. So if we did any type of reprocessing where we were changing folder titles, moving things around in a series, we wanted to make sure that you could find the original folder titles that might have been cited previously. So the first series we reprocess is the port series. Um, here's an example of one of our processing plans. We uh, wrote different processing plans for all 44 series. Um, not, all, not all of them were as in-depth as this. Um, there's a lot of documentation, a lot of spreadsheets with all work behind the scenes and archives. Um, and as part of the processing plans, we wanted to make sure that if we encountered any references to enslaved persons, or other topics that we wanted to discuss with A250 programming, we wanted to slow down and take a closer review of all of the materials. Um, this isn't something we would normally do, but because we knew that there was a lot of interest in this collection, and for all the reasons I've stated previously, we've decided to undertake that work as we are reprocessing the series. And this approach has allowed us to uncover what we call our hidden narratives. So with the port series, this was the first one we processed because we were we knew we were immediately going to digitize it. Um, as of today, the port series is fully digitized and available online. But pretty immediately, we decided we want to process the series at a more granular level of detail because it contains some of the oldest materials from the archives. Um, the series it dates from 1682 to 1882. Um, and on the slide, you can see an example of the legacy finding aid and how the port series was described versus the new finding aid that we created. So you can see we beefed up the description a little bit. Um, it's a little bit more clear what's in the description or what's in the series based on that description. So this series, it contains the records of North Carolina's colonial and early American ports records which provide some of the most robust evidence of maritime, transatlantic, and trans-American trafficking of enslaved persons into North Carolina during the 18th century. In the past, historians have used this series to explore this topic of transatlantic slavery, but we did not have any mention in the original finding aid or catalog. The series, it was originally processed in 1961 and 1962, but it hasn't been updated in 60 years. And while there was a finding aid prepared in 1994, we didn't notice any substantial edits to this 1994 finding aid. Um, and we knew this was a hidden series because the title and the legacy folder titles didn't really give you an understanding of what's actually in the series. 
So we decided to do a folder level description and provide more robust description of the series with a scoping content note. So an example of some of these you know, hidden folders is on the screen. So if you see on the legacy finding aid, there's a folder that's entitled Oath of Collector, Deposition, and Permit. If you're just looking at that, you don't really know what's in there. I mean, it kind of sounds like a boring folder to me. Um, but once we opened the folder, we figured out that these were actually three separate documents that were totally unrelated. So they didn't all need to be in the same folder together. And the deposition was actually a deposition concerning the import of enslaved persons through Port Brunswick in 1789. So, you know, with redescribing the collection, we made sure to put that in the in the container list so that folks understand that those are the materials that this series has. While going through these records, we were documenting all the all the references to enslaved persons being trafficked through the North Carolina ports. I counted 946 enslaved persons recorded in the in the series trafficked in, through the ports between 1773 and 1789. This, of course, we know is an incomplete record of the trafficking of enslaved persons through our ports, often from other American colonies or states, or from the Caribbean or West Africa. We've enhanced the description of this series to illuminate these records, which I think is one of the most important steps to increasing awareness and access to these materials. One of the most notable and egregious examples of trafficking of enslaved persons found in the series is on the screen. It is the record of the Lake Company, which was a company that was created by three enslavers, three businessmen named Josiah Collins, Nathaniel Allen, and Samuel Dickinson. And they trafficked 80 enslaved Africans from West Africa in June 1786 for the purpose of hand digging the Dismal Swamp Canal. So we have documentation of this event in the Port Roanoke account books. Um, and as you can see on the screen, we have documentation of the arrival of their arrival aboard the Brig Camden. And we also know that the Brig Camden made an additional trip to Africa, returning to Edenton with 70 more enslaved persons from Africa in March of 1787. But as I said earlier, all of these materials are now digitized and available online. And also as part of this project, we've gone through the port series um, and we've documented all of the names of enslaved persons we've encountered. Um, with this series, there weren't a ton of names. There's probably like 10 to 20, but all of these names have been documented and indexed to help with genealogists if, if they're looking for specific names. Another example of a series that has some hidden histories that we didn't expect is the Lands, Estates, Boundaries, and Surveys series. Originally, when I was going into processing the series, I thought it would be pretty, pretty straightforward. We would just have to, you know, refolder everything, put it in new nice archival boxes, and we would be done. But pretty quickly after opening up the folders, we realized there was a lot of hidden narratives found in the land and property records, particularly with the confiscated lands records. So on the screen, we have some examples of the documents from the confiscated lands records portion of the series. The confiscated land records detailed property that belonged to loyalists that were confiscated by the state during and after the Revolutionary War. And we found that, of course, this property includes enslaved persons as property. So we decided to slow down and investigate these records more and add this information to the series description. So on the screen, you have several examples of these documents of enslaved persons confiscated as property from Newburn in the Hillsborough District. If you look to the record on the right, it's documenting enslaved persons confiscated from Hillsborough. Um, and you can see that some of these people are documented um, with their names and with their family groupings. So over the summer, we had an intern working on drawing out some of these hidden histories and also recording the names, names of the enslaved persons listed as confiscated property. And here's another example of the confiscated property records. Um, this is an account of sale of 28 enslaved persons enslaved by Thomas Oldham upon his death. Um, these enslaved persons were sold at public auction in Edenton in June 20, on June 22nd, 1782. So as you can see, this document reports the name of the enslaved person. It either lists them as an individual or as a family unit, their new enslaver, and then the amount paid 
um, by the new enslaver to the state because this was confiscated property by the state. Another example of a series that definitely needed more description um, is the miscellaneous group series. So there's actually two miscellaneous series in the Treasures and Comptrollers papers. We have the miscellaneous group, which is all the loose papers, and then we have the miscellaneous volume series. We don't love that this is called miscellaneous group. It's not really giving researchers any information about what's actually in the collection. Typically, you know, we wouldn't call a series miscellaneous because it's not very descriptive. Um, but in this case, we decided we didn't want to change the title because it's been this title for over 60 years. Researchers have cited these materials frequently. But what we did do was to create an itemized description of what's, what's in the series to increase access. And also we made sure to update the language because the language from the 1960s did not meet with our current conscious description standards. And you can see an example of this on the slide. Um, here's part of the legacy finding aid box list, and then the 2024 finding aid has the box, box list as well with some updated language. So while going through the series, we discovered that this is the series that can contain some of the most upsetting records I think we have here at the archives, but we think it's important to highlight these materials as a hidden history. Uh, these are the records pertaining to the magistrates in freeholders courts. These courts were special courts erected to try and convict enslaved persons in the 1700s. These records discuss the executions of enslaved persons, including the discussion of trial proceedings and the certifications of execution, which were all forwarded to the General Assembly's Committee of Claims so the enslaver could be compensated for the state's execution of their enslaved property. So if you look on the slide in the legacy finding aid, the, the folder that had these documents, which is called Payment to Masters for Slaves Executed by the State, that is pretty descriptive of what it is, but we wanted to do a little bit better than that. Um, first off, we wanted to call out that these documents were specifically created by that specific court system, the magistrates and freeholders courts. So on the other side of the slide, you can see the new folder titles that we created. Um, also, there was a lot of materials um, in this folder, so we divided it out because they're, you know, just to make it a little bit easier to access. Here's an example of one of the certificates um, created by the Magistrates and Freeholders Court. This certificate is certifying the conviction and execution of two enslaved men, Davy and Will. Uh, this note, I think, is from March of 1740, and the note states that this execution would have happened two years prior, so presumably sometime around March of 1738. Um, and there are a lot of other documents in this series from the Magistrates and Freeholders Court, and a lot of them have more information than the certificate has. Like, for example, it will say, what is the alleged crime? of the enslaved person that's being tried in, and executed. Um, it'll say like when the execution take, took place, how were they executed, um, how long they stayed in the jail before their, their execution took place. So there are some documents that have a lot more information than this. So here's some more of the work we did with the miscellaneous group series. We updated the language about these materials and emphasize them in the series scope and content note. If you look at that second or third paragraph, um, there's a paragraph just discussing the history of these, this court system. Um, also, we added a content warning just to make it clear that there, you know, these records are depicting acts of violence and terrorism. Um, and then over the summer, we had an intern ex um, examine the series a little bit closer and she indexed all the names of the enslaved persons that were documented in this series. One of the series that has the most research done through this project is the Capitol Building Series. The Capitol Building Series contains extensive financial records that document the construction, maintenance, and repair of the state government buildings, including the State House, which was from 1792 to 1831, and also the current state Capitol Building that was built in 1840. So the original description listed a few folder titles and a volume that references enslaved labor or at least alludes to enslaved labor, 
But during processing, we found that this did not really suffice for documenting the extensive amount of mention, the ex extensive amount of documentation of enslaved labor in this series. So if you look at the legacy finding aid on the left side of the screen, you can see some of the volumes at the bottom. They're like, it's just like state capital, laborers time book, stonecutters and quarry hands time book. So if you're kind of a novice just looking at these records, you probably wouldn't know what type of laborers they were talking about, but most of the time these books are documenting enslaved laborers. Here's an example of some of the documents that are included in this series. This is a receipt for $19.45 in full for hire of Peter the Carpenter for one month of repairs on the state house in the month of August of, I'm assuming August of 1824. So this is a receipt um, that Peter the Carpenter, his enslaver John G. Marshall received um, for his work as a skilled carpenter on the state house. And here's another receipt. Um, it says it's for clearing debris at the state house. And it's stating that Augustus Mordecai, who anyone who's familiar with Raleigh history might recognize, Augustus Mordecai as kind of a prominent businessman and slaver in Raleigh. He was paid $9.20 for the labor done by Squire at the State House Square in April of 1833. So here we're learning about Squire and the work that he's doing in 1833 around the State House. And here's yet another document. There's so many of them in the series, but this one has a little bit more detail. It's talking about um, this is all with other documents that's talking about the work being done around Union Square and digging of a well. But this is stating that Ned, who was enslaved by William Peck, received $3 and William Peck received $3 for Ned's labor um, for cutting down weeds and grass and piling them in the same in the public square. And this work is said to have taken four days. So the narratives in the Capitol buildings series in particular reveal really important truths about the American experience. And I think it's an important story for us to be telling right now. These men and many other enslaved individuals were hired out by their enslavers to the state and labored to build and maintain the state house in the state capital. Buildings that stood as symbols of, of an American government founded upon revolutionary war ideals like liberty and equality. But we can't tell the story of America and North Carolina and liberty and equality without telling the stories of the enslaved laborers that built these buildings and built these symbols. Like other series, we've updated the description to indicate and kind of give the critical context to these materials. And also all the Capitol buildings materials are currently digitized and available online. So the Capitol building series provides one of the best examples of the impact that reprocessing has done for the archives and the outreach we've been able to do with all of this work. Um, for example, Ned Peck's story we fe was featured in the, our Connecting the Docs podcast last January. I definitely recommend everyone to check out our podcast. Um, they come out pretty frequently and they tell a lot of like the hidden histories and the interesting things that we find while we're processing our collections. Um, also on that podcast, I discuss um, some of the ports records in the transatlantic trans-American trafficking of enslaved persons through our ports. Um, I go back. Um, we've also presented about researching the lives of enslaved laborers at the state capitol. We were actually able to connect with a group of researchers with the state capitol, um, and they've created a website called From Naming to Knowing. I definitely recommend all of y'all to check out the From Naming to Knowing website, uh, where they've researched and shared stories of enslaved men who labored in, in, to build and maintain the state capitol buildings. So we were able to connect with them and we were able to give them more details on Ned Peck's story and they were able to update his, his story and his history on the website. And then also I wanna highlight our blog, it's called History for All the People. The link on the screen that says ncarchives.wpcomstaging.com, I guess, wpcomstaging.com, that is the link to our blog. I wish it was a little bit more descriptive, um, but We've, we've published a lot of different blogs about the work we've been doing, not just on this series, but others as well. 
One of the main impacts of this processing project is the expansion of our enslaved persons names project spreadsheet. So currently this is an, an internal document where we add any information we discover about enslaved persons that we find while processing government records. Um, a screenshot of some of the entries is on the slide, but this started in 2019 as a county, as a county project. We were really thinking that as we were doing county processing, if we encountered any names of enslaved persons, we would add it to the spreadsheet. But very quickly, and especially with the Treasures and Comptrollers project, we realized we needed to expand this to include all of government records. So this spreadsheet, it documents several different data points, including the folder in which the document was found, the date of the record, the county, the name of the enslaved person, any additional details. Um, sometimes we might find details of, you know, the age, if they were an adult, if they were a child, um, if there's any family groupings. Um, sometimes in their, a document might be describing an enslaved person, but they are deceased upon the time the document was created. So any information about that, and then their enslavers, any third parties that were part of the document. Um, and with reprocessing the treasurer's and comptroller's papers, um, we've added about 700 names to this spreadsheet. And then using the data from the spreadsheet, over the summer, we had an intern work on expanding this data set, and she created a, a libguide or a collection guide um, that's focused on researching enslaved persons in this collection. So obviously the Treasurer's and Comptroller's papers, it's quite a large collection. Um, and since our intern only had the summer, this libguide is only focusing on three of the series, but we do hope that we can continue to expand the libguide and discuss more series in the future, if I ever have time or if we ever get another intern. So the collection guide is divided into two tables. Um, the first table, it's arranged by item. So each item that discusses enslaved persons, their labor, um, trafficking them through reports, anything like that, each document is an item. And then we list the different subjects pertaining that are like discussed in the document in the subject section. So we hope that this table will be more useful for like historians, folks who aren't researching specific names or specific people, but are interested in specific topics. Here are the subjects that we are currently including on the collection guide. Um, again, I hope this is a living document. I hope we're continuing to add to it. So any constructive feedback from anyone would be wonderful. And then as we add more records, we'll probably expand the amount of topics that we're discussing. And then the part of the LibGuide that I think is going to be most in, most useful to re, to sorry to genealogist is this table by enslaved persons by name. So this table we have all of the names of enslaved persons found in treasures and comptroller's papers. Uh, we have it alpha, alphabetized. Um, also, our intern, if she could determine that say an enslaved person was mentioned across several different documents and she could confirm that this was the same person, she would include that in the same, in the same row. So for example, um, on this page, we see that there's three enslaved women by the name of Africa. We weren't able to confirm that these are the same women. So they have three different, three different entries. But currently, we're happy to include our internal spreadsheets of researchers and genealogists, anyone who's interested. And this libguide that we're working on, it's still being finalized. We're still finishing it. But hopefully, we'll be able to publish it on our website by the end of the year. So thank you all for spending your Sunday afternoon with me and learning a little bit about the Treasures and Comptroller's papers. Um, this collection is definitely not a traditional source you would think to use for genealogy. But I hope I've de demonstrated to y'all today that this collection is so much more than just the numbers. Um, I think genealogy is a wonderful skill and it's a great way to examine the historical record and learn so many things about your personal ancestors or answer some wider historical questions. And one of my favorite things about conducting genealogical research is the importance of thinking outside the box and re-examining the subject from so many different angles. So I think often you find answers in sources and places that you wouldn't you know, normally expect. Um, 
And especially when it comes to doing genealogy research on enslaved persons, the more institutions that continue to gather and record data on enslaved persons mentioned in their record. Um, and as these data sets expand, I hope that genealogists are able to make more and more connections through these projects. Um, I would definitely recommend reaching out to different institutions and seeing if they have any resources or internal documents documenting this work, because I do know a lot of institutions are working on this, these type of projects, but they might not have reached the publication stage yet. Um, so I hope one day that all this data will be, you know, aggregated and it'll be a really powerful tool for genealogists. Um, but I've listed a couple of projects that I think folks might be interested in. Um, I definitely think everyone should check out the From Na Naming to Knowing website that I mentioned earlier. And then also, if you haven't heard of the People Not Property Project, this is a project where several institutions are collaborating and um, documenting names of enslaved persons found in county records. So thank you again. Just to wrap up, the Treasures and Comptrollers Papers Rehousing and Reprocessing Project it's just our first step in modernizing our collections. What we were able to do with this project is adjust the lens we're using to think about and describe this collection. This is a collection of financial papers, but we want to illuminate that these are financial papers, papers that speak to and are undergirded with the fact that they are documenting an, an economy structured around enslaved labor. So this collection contains critical materials that help us understand really basic and really important things about North Carolina's economy and society through the 17th and 19th centuries. We want to illuminate and pull the veil away from these narratives. Um, these are financial records, but they reveal how deeply slavery was embedded in North Carolina's economic system. They also reveal the layers of how enslaved labor interacted with the government, such as the enslavers hiring out enslaved laborers to work at the state capitol, or the government's involvement with public improvement projects like the Dismal Swamp Canal. The ultimate goal of this project is to make it clear to researchers that this collection is more than just numbers. These records are extremely important to documenting North Carolina's past and creating a more inclusive historical narrative. Also, I want to acknowledge that there is a lot of hidden narratives that we haven't had a chance to explore yet with processing, and that includes the American Indian experience. We know that the Treasures and Comptroller's Papers has a lot of documentation of this. Um, but as I said, this is an ongoing project we hope to continue doing this work. And we also hope to continue to build on our initial, our initial work with our LibGuide, our collection guide. And I really hope the Treasures and Comptrollers papers will be really useful to historians and genealogists alike. And I can't wait to share the collection guide with you guys soon. All right, thank you guys. That's about all I have for you today. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Caroline, that was amazing, and I it just was so fulfilling because I know that I did the right thing by asking you to come here today. The three blog posts were so fabulous. I knew there had to be so much more, so thank you on behalf of Let's Talk North Carolina Genealogy, and thank you, you know, just on for everybody because that was wonderful. Mm -hmm. uh, we did have uh sorry Tanias we do have uh several questions for you let me just change the view here for a minute and before you take down your PowerPoint uh we do have someone asking if you could show the slide with the links on it again um There's, let me there we go that one yeah it just uh we, uh, we generally ask that people not, you know, take pictures of the slides or anything, but do you mind people just screenshotting that one? Yeah, of course. I included our blog, the Naming from Knowing website, the People Not Property, and then at the bottom, those are the links to our digital collections that has the ports in the Capitol buildings. Um, hopefully the rest of it will be digitized soon, but it might be a little while. Okay, great. Oh, and it looks like someone, thank you, uh, Andrea Price <laughs> yes. has put it into the chat. So that's absolutely wonderful. Thank you so much for doing that. Uh, speaking of which, let me remind everyone because the chat has been very busy. Uh, you can, on my screen, it's three dots at the top of the chat box. Sometimes it may be at the bottom of the chat box. 
click on those three horizontal dots and you should see save chat and you'll want to do that now and then do it again right before we um, close the program. So Tania is going to start with the first couple of first question for you, Caroline, if you're <laughs> ready. And I'm going to go All ahead right. and um, ask you to stop the share so that we can just come back into community. Thank you. All right. Well, speaking of connections, Caroline, we have someone named Gloria Waller. And she wants to know if Waller is your maiden name and maybe where what counties are your family is from? Um, it is my maiden name. Um, my father's family is from Rowan County. Okay. But I know All there's right. several branches of Wallers in North Carolina. Okay. Well, Gloria, if that's the connection avenue for you, I'm sure Caroline wouldn't mind an email. <laughs> so, All right. Our next question, let me go back to my list, is if I got this right. So Robert asks, can we get on a distribution list for records that are digitized at the archives as they are updated? What is the process for, for that? What would you recommend? Hmm. That's a really good idea. Um, I think for most of the like series or collections that are digitized, they're typically posted about in our blog history for all the people. So if you got on the blog listserv where you got, you know, notified every time a blog is published, you'll probably get that information. Okay, the next question um, is from Mary LaValle, and she's going to have a couple more coming up. Um, and she would like to know how are records prior to North Carolina's creation handled? Like colonial records? Uh, before North Carolina became a state. So yes, they okay. would be colonial. Um, they're pretty much handled the same. So I really work with just like county records and state agency records. Um, so in some of our county records, we have records prior to like like the records from that area prior to when that county was actually created. Um, I mean, we treat them all kind of the same. And I know that there is a colonial records record group at the state archives. That's not my area of expertise, but I would definitely reach out to the reference staff at, if you're interested in colonial records. Thank you. All right, I think, so David McCorkle asked, are there any plans to use AI to transcribe any or all of your digital collections like Family Searcher is doing. Um, he's noting that there are tons of people using that to find hidden ancestors in places they wouldn't expect. That's a great question. Um, I'm not aware of them. We're, I mean, I feel like that would be a lot of work, but it sounds like an exciting avenue to explore, um, but I don't have an answer on that, maybe. <laughs> Now, Tricia was asking about where the Connecting the Dots podcast could be found, and a couple of people Googled it and put a link in, so let me just make sure that's correct, that it's connectingdots.podbean.com. That sounds right. Yeah, you can find it pretty much anywhere you find your podcast. Yes, that's correct, yes. So it's, okay. yeah, Connecting the Dots, D-O-C-S. Yeah, the Podbean is one location. So yeah, you would search by the title of the podcast across these platforms. All right. Tania, you have Mary's question next. All right, let me go to my... I, oh, I can... No, okay, go ahead. I'll do there. the one after that. Yeah. Okay, so Mary LaValle would like to know, are enslaved Native Americans identified in the record set? Hmm. <laughs> I have not found an instance of where it's saying that they're enslaved Native American versus just enslaved African descent. Um, there very well could be. Um, it just doesn't say like the race of the person, unfortunately, from what I've seen. All right, the next question I, I have, and maybe if I've missed one, Renata, you'll let me know. But Nikki asks, and someone else also asked, how can they look at the enslaved person spreadsheet? And Caroline, I think you mentioned it, but it wouldn't hurt to reiterate. Yeah, so it's an internal document right now. But if anyone is interested, you can email me and I can share it with you. Um, also, once the LibGuide is published, um, a lot of that data is going to be on the LibGuide as well. So hopefully that will be published by the end of the year. 
I'm sure you're going to get a lot of emails <laughs> from this, this particular group. And um, I'll well, be glad someone's finding it useful. <laughs> yes, this is uh, very useful. Um, okay, I, yeah, I may have gotten a little off also. Now, <laughs> Robert asked about a URL to the research guide, but I think that's the same thing maybe that we were just talking yeah, about. Yeah, I haven't so. a URL yet. Um, mm -hmm. It's still, we have to get everything approved by management and, you know, all the editing finished before we can publish it on our website. So it always takes longer than we would hope. But hopefully by the end of the year, we'll have like somewhere we can send folks. And Robert also wants to know how individuals reviewing the scans can input data that they find into your research guide. Hmm. I believe you can comment on our digital collections. I don't really work in digital collections that much, but I think you can leave comments if there's edits that you think need to be made, or you can just reach out to our public services staff if you see anything that needs to be edited. Okay. And before Tania asks the last question in the chat, I'll just remind you, if someone else, if you have questions, you can raise your hand and come right on camera or off camera and ask them yourself. All right. Um, let's see. The question I think just came through was, Karen, will there be a breakdown by county? And are the records currently restricted to pre-1800? So for treasures and comptrollers, like in the spreadsheet we've compiled of enslaved persons' names, if the county is obvious and it states it and we can tell what it is, we do have the county information. A lot of times it doesn't include that information because they're like state level records. Um, and what was the second part of that question? Um, the second part of the question is, are they restricted to pre-1800? No. No. Okay. Most of them happen to be more 1700s just because of the nature of this collection, but a lot of our county records on enslaved persons are typically closer to like 1860. Okay, um, well, I'm gonna go ahead and just thank you again, Caroline. And I don't know if you're able to stay for just a couple of minutes more until uh, in case someone comes up with another question. Uh, Tania and I have a few announcements we'd like to make before too many people leave. If you need to leave, Caroline, we totally understand. So just thank you. And I hope you will take a look at the chat because you have lots of accolades, lots mm -hmm. of, you know, appreciative um, comments. Uh, your talk was fabulous. And I know I can't wait to replay it uh, <laughs> just so that I can hear, you know, every single word of it without being distracted. I'm going to stop the recording here. So let me do that. Except I can't find it. Oh, there it is. <laughs> <laughs>